All right. Well, if you're just joining us, um, welcome everybody to this CSDMS Human Dimensions Group virtual coffee hour. I'm Greg Tucker. I'm the director of CSDMS. For those of you who are new to CSDMS, it is um, an organization and a community that is all about modeling research for Earth surface dynamics. So everything and anything having to do with the dynamics of the surface of the Earth, its changes through time, whether on human time scales or geologic time scales, whether by what uh, we used to call natural processes or um, by human agency. And of course, part of that is exploration, not only of human agency, but of, of impacts by and on human beings on our changing global environment. And CSDMS is um, organized into about a dozen so-called working and focus groups. One of those groups is the Human Dimensions Working Group, and it is chaired by Catherine Ennard and Moira Zellner, and they are your hosts for this event. So I'm gonna turn over the floor to them. Thank you very much, uh, Greg. It, it's exciting to uh, be here. And uh, I would like to welcome everybody. So I'm, I'm Maura Zellner. I'm at Northeastern University and co-chairing the Human Dimensions Group for a while. Uh, I, I let Catherine also introduce herself in, 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 maybe go ahead, Catherine, if you want to introduce yourself now, and then I'll go into the intro. Sure. I'm Catherine Anardi. I'm Moira's co-chair uh, co as part of this group. I'm a coastal engineer and geomorphologist, and a lot of my work is uh, related to modeling humans or introducing humans into geomorphic modeling frameworks. And of course, I always forget to introduce myself fully, uh, uh, but what I do is work on participatory uh, modeling. So really engaging stakeholders and uh, different kinds of, of um, you know, people who have different interests and perspectives on the complex problems that are tied to social environmental issues. And uh, um, and how do we make sense of this complex world together? And how do we make decisions uh, uh, about this world that we share? Um, and so with that, the 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 concept for this particular uh, uh, webinar or coffee hour uh, was um, because when we had our meeting in May, and by the way, CSDMS has its annual meeting uh, in in May. You may want to always, uh, you know. Sign up for it and be part of of this discussion. But one of the things that came up in our in our focus group uh, related to human dimensions is that there's a lot of us who work in the space and with communities, but we are not necessarily trained as natural scientists, as earth scientists, in how to engage with community. And so what we that kind of like gave rise to this idea of like having a panel where we share some of the uh, what we know and our experience for from people who are working in this space in different ways. Um, and so, of course, I have always my hat of participatory modeler, but you know, we, we have today uh, Laura Schmidt Olabisi, Leila Lyons, Amiana Vaughan. Welcome, welcome to all of you who, who from different perspectives are going to share with us, you know, what, what they know today. So do you want to uh, just go ahead and uh, you know, Laura, if you want to go first with a with a quick introduction, Mehana follows and, and Leila uh, last, and then we'll get into our, our panel. We'll just jump straight into our panel. Sure. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, it's evening here, but I think it's morning for most of you, so I'll say good morning. Um, I am Laura Schmidt-Olabisi. I'm a professor at Michigan State University in the Department of Community Sustainability and the Environmental Science and Policy Program. This year, I'm a visiting climate scientist at the International Institute for Tropical Agriculture in Ibadan, Nigeria, which is one of the CG networks, if you're familiar with, with those for agricultural research. Um, I'm an ecologist and environmental scientist by training. Uh, like Moira, I've been a participatory modeler for pretty much all of my career, ever since I started to realize that sustainability problems require the perspectives and lived experiences of people that are dealing with those problems in real world systems. So I've worked with communities and decision makers over the course of my career on a range of issues uh, related to sustainability and environment. Um, a lot of my work recently is in uh, climate adaptation and food and agriculture systems. Thank That's you, Laura. And Leila, actually, if you don't mind going next, because I think uh, Mian is trying to set up. Um, and so if, if you don't mind introducing yourself next. 
Yeah, absolutely, no problem. Uh, so hi, I'm Layla Lyons. Um, so as my background indicates, I'm currently at the National Science Foundation, um, where I'm a program director. Um, I'm in the Division on Research and Learning in Formal and in Informal Settings in the EDU Directorate. So we like our acronyms at NSF, but I, you know, I'm housed within, you know, the educational side of, of the research sphere at, at NSF. Um, but that said, I do a lot of work across programs, um, you know, across the uh, Institute, anything to do with educational technology, basically, I probably have a finger in it. So I'm a program director for the AI Institute's uh, Smart and Connected Communities, which is a program that is probably of high interest to uh, those of you who are attending here. So if you don't know about it, happy to answer questions about it. You should be thinking about applying to it. Um, the ITEST program, which uh, stands for Innovative Technology Experiences for Students and Teachers, although that also funds um, informal learning, it's just K-12 informal learning, um, and the uh, Research on Innovative Technologies for Enhanced Learning, or the RITEL program, and so that's where we do a little bit more uh, experimental uh, type research into educational technologies, uh, and I'm also the co-lead of the Advancing Informal STEM uh, learning program or ASL. And so that funds um, cradle to grave learning um, as long as it's not taking place in school or a workplace. Um, but my uh, prior life before joining NSF, um, I used to have a split position with uh, the University of Illinois at Chicago, where I was a professor in computer science and a member of the Learning Sciences Research Institute, and also the um, New York Hall of Science, which is a hands-on science museum in New York, uh, where I was the director of digital learning research. And my area of expertise is in designing, building, and developing learning assessment methods for uh, informal computer-supported collaborative learning experiences. And so that's a catch-all. I did a lot of my work in museums and zoos, but why my work is relevant to this discussion is I actually had a partnership with Mora for a good number of years, and we were both at UIC together, and we were designing, well, I was designing the interfaces for the participatory um, meetings that she wanted to be able to conduct using simulations. So it was this challenge of how you could get uh, novices from a simulation perspective engaged meaningfully in what the simulations could let them do and explore and know. And so we were using some creative technologies to try to make that more accessible and fun, frankly, for the participants. Thank you so much, Leila. Um, and I miss you. Um, and I see Mana smiling a face here, even though it's super early for her. Thank you, Mana, for joining. Can you go ahead with your intro? I'm sure I'll greet you from my home here on Kauai to start. E aloha kea, no kila we ala, e ao kaina, o ni hoku, u kila kila, o na mahana la, hana na lima i kono keko. Koa elele, ika ika ila kai ko olao. O kahili, pili na ohana, iki lawe ala e aloha e. Aloha e, e aloha e. Aloha e. Aloha mai kako. Um, thank you so much to Moira and Catherine for having us today and for organizing this panel. Um, I'm coming to you from Kilauea, Kauai. Um, we're the northernmost of the main Hawaiian islands, not the most northwest, but the most north. Um, that's a chant um, that my children, my daughters and I wrote. Um, and in about an hour, you'll, you'll, you'll hear it at the elementary school. The public elementary school here starts their day every morning at eight with all of the kids chanting um, for the mountains and the winds of our home. Um, and it talks about this mountain Nihoku. And I'll just give you a short story as, by way of introduction. Um, Nihoku is a volcanic crater. It's why, why we are named Kilauea. Many of you are um, know the Kilauea volcano on the other end of the island chain that is still interrupt, er, erupting. Um, it was dug by our volcano goddess Pele um, on her looking for a home for her fires um, and then crashed in by her sister, the ocean, as she headed on and built other craters, mimicking the journey of the hotspot um, to the current Hawaiian islands. Um, so I guess I tell you about this volcano because I was in court all day in a community contested case hearing as one of the interveners. 
um, to prevent the building of a really large luxury mansion at the very top of this um, sacred mountain to our community. Um, this mountain has become one of the largest refugia for native seabirds in the world. And as the Northwest Hawaiian Islands are going underwater with climate change, more and more seabirds are being brought here. Um, I was part of the third contested case. Our community has been working to defend this mountain for over 40 years since the agricultural sugar lands around us um, got split up and bought up and have become more growing real estate and growing high-end homes and not growing food. Um, and so there was a luxury subdivision proposed in 1980 and the community had a contested case then and got all these conditions passed, including a setback line that um, homes couldn't rise above. Um, but the developer has kept trying to move that line and change that line. So over 40 years, um, we've had three contested cases too, as 700 community members signed a petition to say, hold that line. Um, so I'm the last um, in a generation. And yesterday, all of my children testified before the planning commission. Um, and yesterday we won. Um, the hearing officer made amazing recommendations to protect the mountain, and they were upheld unanimously by the planning department before um, 13 community members came to testify. So I tell you this story because my community engagement in science, um, it, I was just born into it. I didn't have a choice. I was a child at those first public hearings. And for our people, for Native Hawaiians, and that's why we start with Oli and addressing the place. Um, place is part of community. So when we work with the people of a community, we have to work with the places that shape them. And place and people are one and the same and integrated. Um, so that's how I come to my science. Um, as a, on the community side, I still live in my community, work in my community, support community groups. Um, so here I'm an advocate and called upon to do things like be an intervener that no one else has time to do because I have privilege being a university professor. I have flexibility and more time to take off work yesterday and be in a hearing, right? Um, than if you're waiting tables and cleaning visitor accommodations and landscaping fancy yards, which is what most of my friends do. Um, so that's how I came to community engagement, but I'll just conclude by saying that, um, so at the University of Hawaii, um, I've, I'm in a natural resources and environmental management, and I focus on integrated science, social and natural and indigenous science to support community groups. So the one that I'm a part of um, is one of about 10 in our community. And in 2022, we figured out it's one of 240 community groups statewide caring for 270 different sites, fish ponds, taro patches, mountains, community farms, and sometimes entire watersheds, mountain to sea, um, largely led by Hawaiian community members, um, but very, very diverse, um, and all of them doing largely education and ecosystem restoration, in addition to many other things from healthcare provision to food provision to climate change resilience to demilitarization and social justice work. Um, so my students and I at UH do research to support these efforts and to help these community groups, as well as studying them and trying to understand the stories of the growth of this movement. We went from about 90 community groups in the 1990s to 270, um, adding about 80 a decade. Um, so this is tremendous growth and return of land and waters to community care and governance in Hawaii. Um, so that's sort of the work I study and support. And the last thing I'll say is I have a nonprofit um, that I've helped to found with other women here on Kauai, um, that it's a native women led land trust that works for land returns to co communities um, and also to return communities to land. Um, oh. And I'm so happy to be here with you all today. Thank you so much, Mayana. What a beautiful way to start the, the, the panel. So we'll jump right into, into the questions. Uh, and the way that we're going to do this, we're going to ask each panelist a question. They're going to lead the answer, but like the others are welcome to, to join as well. And we'll dedicate about 10 minutes, a little bit less than 10 minutes uh, for each question. And then we'll open it up for Q&A uh, moderated by Catherine. So uh, Laura, so the first question for you, we had like, you know, as I mentioned, a lot of people who's, who are very interested in community engaged research in this community, but how... How does one get started? So if you can share some of your stories. Sure, yeah. And wow, what a great panel. Thanks all for your introductions. Uh, that was really inspiring. Um, so, okay, I, I I was gonna start at one place, but now I'm kind of prompted to start in another place. So I, I think it's, it's always important to back up a bit and you know ask yourself why you want to engage. 
Um, you know, there's been a lot of a lot more, and I think others are going to get into more of the ethics and values of, of community engagement, which are extremely important. But I just want to kind of put a, a bookmark in it now to say that, you know, there's been a lot of discussion in recent years as participatory research and engaged research have, have taken off and have become more um, valued, I think, in a good way uh, in the mainstream. Uh, but then there's been a lot of questioning too about what does it really mean to engage ethically and to do this do this well. Um, and you know when you have uh, you know more impetus to do it for grants and publications, there's a you know in a way that's a, a, a good thing that's getting more attention, but in a way it can also prompt more exploitative and kind of <clears throat> one dimen uh, you know one sided type of research. So. You know, I, I guess I would preface this by saying I hope that if you want to engage, uh, you're, you're really doing it um, with with an eye to to have it be a mutually beneficial, mutually respectful and, you know, helpful relationship for everyone, uh, for communities and for the science. Right. So um, so if that's not where you're at, maybe re reconsider, re reframe and, and you know, go from there. Um, but if that is where you're at. You know, I do have a lot of particularly younger uh, students and faculty, you know, asking me, like, how do I get started? So the first thing I would say is to look for uh, boundary organizations. So these are organizations, maybe they're within your institution or within the community you want to engage with or uh, or even outside of both, um, whose job it is to kind of make these connections. Right. So two examples in our university, which is a land grant university, we have uh, extension, which has an explicit mission, right, to connect uh, research to communities and to people who are going to use it. We also have the Office of Outreach and Engagement, which also has that kind of mission. And there's a complicated history about why they're different at MSU and your institution maybe, you know, have its own thing. But uh, but basically, those are organizations within our university whose goal is to connect research to communities. And they have longstanding relationships with communities. They can put you in touch with, with folks who might be interested in working with you, et cetera. Um, another place to start would be to, you know, go to somebody who has been doing engaged research and, and who at least from observing them, you think is doing it ethically and, and you know, building good relationships and, and talk to them about how how they got started. Um, there are also boundary organizations within communities. So, for example, in Flint, Michigan, we worked with the Community Foundation for Greater Flint. So this is a, um, a community based organization. It has a mission to uh, help the community and to distribute grants to the community. But they also do um, rely on research to make some of their decisions and they interface with um, larger funding organizations. And so they're uh, cultivating relationships with universities. So if you, you know, look around a little bit, you will find some of these organizations that help make, make introductions for you. Um, another thing you can do is to, uh, particularly if it's your own community or, or one that you're living in that you're interested in going to, you know, just go to community events and show up, um, you know, places where people gather and have conversations with people and, and learn about what are the issues the community is dealing with? What are they facing? You know, if, if your research isn't um, a good fit to, to work on that, maybe, you know, somebody who, whose research is a good fit. Um, so you're going to have to get out of your office, though. This, <laughs> sometimes I kind of laugh because people are like, can I just sit here and my, like have people come to me? No, you're going to have to leave your office. You're going to have to talk to people. You're going to have to talk to people who are different than you. You're going to have to talk to people that maybe you're a little bit uncomfortable with the situation. Um, but trust me, it's going to be worth it because um, the collaborations you can make are so rich and so rewarding. So that's where I'll start. Thank you. Thank you so much, Laura. I am looking at the time, and I don't. I, I I wonder whether we should just move forward to the second to the second question, Catherine. What do you think, or should we? Yeah, we, we can always go back to the Q and A with with more you know richness to each one of these questions as well. Um, so the next question is for Miana. So how do we engage well? How do we create mutually beneficial processes like what Laura was just mentioning and and outcomes for scientists and partners? Uh, how do we build public trust in such collaborative projects? Mm -hmm. 
Um, well, I wanted to thank you all for being here, first of all. And if at any point you can turn on your camera so we can see you, please do. I know this is a sort of interactive event. And I like, you know, what Laura said, I, you know, be realistic, first of all. Um, I'm in an extension professorship. Hi, it's good to see you, Albert and George. Um, and so working with communities is valued as part of my position. And I posted some guidelines from UHC Grant because she talked about boundary organizations. And these are, you know, Hawaii-based guidelines for how to do this kind of work well. But some institutions really value community work and make that easier. You might be in a position or a job which doesn't, and you still believe it's important and you're trying to. So I think, first of all, be realistic with the conditions you're facing and what you can offer, what your expertise is, and like Laura said, why, um, and be honest about that. You know, you have to manage expectations a bit. If you can tap into existing partnerships where you contribute and you grow and then, you know, and you can step in and out and others keep it going, that's wonderful too. Um, but I guess I would just say the main thing is start with community needs. What are the issues the community is facing and what are the questions they have and the research needs they have or the climate data needs they have. So many communities are working on the front lines of climate change right now and facing climate change. So modeling climate change impacts can be so useful. There's so many ways um, the kinds of science that's done by people here in this room um, can help communities at this vital time. So starting with that, what questions do they have? And can you do a research project um, that answers their questions? Can you contribute to, to research they're already doing? What's already happening and how can you jump in? Um, so that's the first thing. Um, research has many stages, right? There's data collection, there's question formation, there's um, analysis. So sometimes it's participatory and community gauged every step of the way. Right, And if it's a community question that you form together, community can help collect data, they can help analyze, and better yet, they can help disseminate and act on it. But it might be that you're being participatory at one phase. If it's not their question and they don't care, it's going to be hard to have community collect data. right? Um, but maybe it's your project all the way, but that it's relevant to them and you can go back and share that data and they can help make sense of it. right? So think about plugging in at different phases. Um, also, just kind of really know that communities are really busy and trying to understand what they're facing. So if you can go to existing work days, existing community meetings, and have that be where the research updates happen instead of a whole other set of meetings, it's going to be way better. And if you show up with no expectation and just work with people for a while, like all our Hawaii community groups have once a month work days. We love the researchers that just come for a few months and are there. Um, and we always, you know, because then we know them as people and then people try, and then you start to have conversations and you dream up research and projects that neither the community nor you could have envisioned based on being on the land together. And, 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 and a lot of times communities care more about what people do than say. Um, and we're used to those researchers talking, <laughs> but if you can show up as a doer first and we can weed together or um, measure you know, shoreline changes together or be together, you know, then then that builds a lot of trust and partnership and laughter and connection and, and insight into what your gifts are and how your tools really are useful. And that that kicks, makes it really fun and, and, and trusting. It makes so I guess the last thing is whatever step you're in, always build partnership, always build relationship, always before the work and the, the deadline and the data is like, who are people? And who are you? Who are they? And how do we connect? Um, if you can hang in with the community for a long time, that's really important. It's hard with the grants we get. They're short. They want high impact that's scalable, <laughs> in and out, boom, right? Um, so that's a challenge. Um, so that's why partnering um, so that others can keep it moving. But it's if you can work with communities over long periods of time, it's so, so valuable. Um, more and more, I'm, I'm getting students from communities and trying to support the work they want to do because they already have relationships and they already have responsibility that their community is raising them for. Um, and then also, I try to find the communities no other researchers are in because you'll notice funding will come and everyone will be going to the same places, like all the funding, all the research, all the students, all the people. And they get tired and, and I try to equalize the pie. Like where is a place where a project would make a huge difference and try to send people there. Thank you so much. I mean, I, I'm thinking also, like, as you're saying, like the importance of, of, of play, 
uh, in the process and and always like you know prioritizing the relationship building aspect of it that is is so important. Uh, Leila, Laura, is there anything that you'd like to add? We have like three minutes. Uh, if if you wanted to add to anything that Mihana just uh, mentioned. Well, I think I'll be speaking to some of the same issues in a later question. So I'll, I have some notes. Just second everything. That was all excellent points. Yes. And I think that we all share kind of like that, that experience and that, uh, from also like in, in in my from my perspective at least from failing <laughs> miserably uh, early on uh for you know for not not understanding how important uh, this was and kind of like discovering it uh in the process and and how really when you prioritize that aspect of relationship building and that's the important part then everything else just kind of like you know aligns uh much much more easily um so uh definitely so we can go to the third one um, Leila, uh, so what are some common mistakes since I talked about them? Uh, how to deal with a legacy of extractive practices that, you know, unfortunately is part of the scientific process oftentimes, and how to avoid overburdening communities, which is also some of the aspects that, that Mayana just mentioned. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I'm, I'm speaking, you know, under the ages of, you know, the National Science Foundation, which, you know, has, has sponsored a lot of good and has unintentionally sponsored a lot of ill. Um, as, as we've just been discussing and, you know, listening to the previous discussion, you know, this, the concerns about, you know, extractive engagement, the concerns about, um, you know, trying to insert yourself into communities that are already doing their own thing <laughs> and how you can do that in a way that, that you know, yields mutual benefits. I mean, these are real challenges and, and you know, I'll be the first to admit, and I, and I don't, I think NSF is pretty straightforward about this too. We haven't always done the best job, right? I mean, we're, we have a certain charge that's given to us by the federal government. You know, we are supposed to support research and it has been a, a long and slow realization to get, people on the same page in recognizing that the research can't happen without the human side also being in place. And that the human side isn't something that happens magically. We don't wave magic wands. Uh, it takes time. And frankly, it takes money. So, you know, ultimately, that's what the National Science Foundation does. We give money. I mean, we put lots of other fancy words around it, but we make choices about how to distribute money. And so the ways in which we do that can be hugely impactful. Uh, to both research and to the communities that, that are engaged or not engaged in that research. And so we've been experimenting with different modes of giving out that money uh, to make these things a bit more uh, equitable, uh, collaborative, uh, joint. Um, we're thinking a lot more about power sharing in a way that we hadn't before. And it's not universal across the Institute. You know, that every you know, for better or for worse, we're a pretty um, heterogeneous organization where different directorates have their authority to do things their own way, which is appropriate, you know, because we all have different fields, but we do see this starting to crop up across the institutions. And I want to talk about a couple programs today uh, where we've been experimenting with these techniques. So um, I mentioned earlier the Smart and Connected Communities program. I'm going to put a link in the chat. Um, so it has, um, and you'll see here, this solicitation is a little bit out of date. It, we have a rolling deadline for the program, and we're going to have a new solicitation posted shortly. So the program is not over. We are accepting funding. Uh, just be a little bit patient for the new solicitation to get published. And the other program I want to draw attention to is the uh, Advancing Informal STEM Learning Program. That's the one I'm the co-lead of. So for both of these programs, we have a new type of grant category uh, called Partnership and Planning Awards. And what those are intended to do is support a year's worth of efforts to bring researchers and community members in close contact with one another to build those kinds of relationships that Mahana was talking about um, so eloquently just a moment ago. So the way you would go about seeking this funding is you would, first of all, have to have at least interest from the community. The community should be, you know, you're not, you can't just say, I want to contact these people with this money. No, no, no. This is a, a proposal you should be submitting in conjunction with the community itself. And um, when we review things, I can tell you that, that we prepare our reviewers, although a lot of them are coming with this consciousness, so we have to do less and less of this preparation as years go by, but we prepare our reviewers to look for certain kinds of evidence that these partnerships are, are valid, they're equitable, they um, are respectful. And you know some of that comes to the uh, way in which the uh, 
project proposal itself is written, you know, the narrative, and some of it comes to the way the budget allocations are being made. So we pay very close attention that, you know, people aren't being asked to do too much, you know, so this idea of adding extra work to communities is not something we want to be doing, but sometimes we have to, you know, they're, they're, you know, sometimes we do need people to go out of their way, and we want to make sure that people are compensated for their time and their efforts and their ideas in a fair way, you know, so we went through a long period where we were just giving sort of tokenistic um, participant support to people. And it wasn't, not only was it not sufficient to cover, you know, lost wages and things like that, if they were to step away from their income earning opportunities to participate, it also was rather disrespectful. It, it, you know, we we show value through money in our society, our capitalistic society, whether we like it or not. And so when we review these proposals, we are looking for the respect being evidenced within those budgets. Um, the other thing that we look for is um, not a situation where a researcher is coming to this community with an idea already fully formed, because that doesn't do any good. That, that contravenes the purpose of these kinds of planning grants. We want that planning to be happening actively in this year's period. And we want those discussions to be, you know, co-creational, you know. And so the, you know, what we ask our reviewers to look for is, is this proposal um, being thoughtful and respectful in the methods it is proposing for engaging in these discussions. You know, so we're, you know, if somebody says, well, we'll just meet six times a year, that that's not a process argument. We're looking for arguments for how you're going to elicit the ideas and feedback from the community members. We're looking for principles guiding the decision-making processes and power sharing involved in these uh, partnership planning exercises. And um, we're looking for outcomes that respects the interests of both the researchers and the community members. So that's, I, I, I've just been talking at you guys for a while. I'm happy to take questions about how we do this, why we do this, but I, I do wanna you know, give a good plug. These are really, really fascinating and successful projects, usually the ones that we see pitched. And, and it's a way of opening up to communities um, who you know, aren't typically getting the funding as we were just talking about um, previously. So, you know, I really strongly encourage you to do it. Uh, I strongly encourage you to contact me or others at NSF. We're happy to talk about it and, and give you advice for how to you know, pitch these proposals in a way that's going to be successful for all parties. Thank you so much, Leila. Laura, Miana, do you want to add anything to what Leila just uh, shared with us? I just wanna thank you, Leila. And you know, to see these directions at NSF and other funding organizations is really important. Um, I'll just share part of the Smart and Connected Communities a related, related grant was the Civic Innovation Grant um, that I put the link in. Our community was lucky to get one. And it actually, it provided for a community sub-awardee. Um, but what that meant was we had a, we, we broke the US rainfall record in um, flooding in 2018. We had almost 50 inches of rain in 24 hours. and you know, landslides closed our highway, we had to evacuate people. And there were all these community recommendations after that. But of course, government funding, FEMA funding after a disaster is all about putting things back sort of how they were, rebuilding the roads where they were. And the community recommendations were about a truly new normal um, and proactive sort of environmental care to prevent flooding. So we went for this grant to forward that work. Um, and so we were able, it was a, a million dollar grant and $700,000 went immediately to the subawardee and they and so that meant the thing Layla said was so important people need to leave their jobs or have jobs to be in your research especially if they're leading it in a meaningful way and and our community is really expensive and hard to leave live in so that had to be good jobs and so the more money that could go we can we created 10 community jobs um, over the course, it was a one year grant and thank you NSF for the ability to extend because you also have to be flexible right and if our in our community if an elder dies the work stops for months. That's just how it is no one is available to help you with the work or to lead the work or do their jobs or, you know, and so um, the flexibility we also started this during COVID so we were able to extend the work. Um, and that was really, really important. Um, but it also really allowed it to be community led. I guess the last thing you'll say is you have to actually um, share power. And when your community tells you it, we were supposed to install weather stations um, to have you know better modeling of on the ground flood expectations. But the problem was past researchers have put tons of weather stations in our mountains. And then the technology's been outmoded and they've just left them there. And so we had these helicopter funds 
to go into very sacred spaces that need a lot of protocol to get to these mountain areas. And the community said, could you use those helicopter funds to get out all the existing weather stations instead of putting new ones in? That was a big thing for our scientific team and researchers that are part of larger mesonet networks to put in weather stations and those are vital and trying to, um, but, but, but for our outcome to be a map of all of the equipment that needs to be taken out and to get a lot of it and to say to other researchers, hey, this community doesn't want more until this is cleaned up was really, really fundamental outcome. Thank you, Mayana. Laura, is there anything that you would like to add? No, I just will add my uh, thanks to NSF for really, I think, among federal granting agencies being kind of a thought leader in this space, um, more so than other federal agencies I've worked with, I think really understanding what it means to do community engaged research and to, as Mahana said, share power with, with community. Um, and I will say that having served on some of these panels, it's it's very true that you can tell right away who is really in partnership and who is basically just called somebody up the day before the grant was due and slapped them on it. Like, um, you're not going to fool anybody <laughs> when you submit one of these proposals. So, you know, that that being said, if you're interested in doing it, you know, do your your background work, your relationship building, like others have said, and really make sure that you're ready to go into this with a truly co-designed uh, proposal. Yeah. And if, if I just may add that, well, first of all, I'm super excited because Leila and I have been, you know, when we were both researchers in Chicago, we were like, yeah, banging our heads against NSF and like the way that they conceived of this. And I'm so grateful that she's taken on this and actually has been part of the leadership that has transformed NSF in this in this sense. So I'm super grateful for for your service there. I think that it does everybody, you know, uh, so much good. But the other thing that I would like to add to this is like how the relationship building process, like if you, if if this is the a way that you want to go with your work then you really have to think of this as a long-term ongoing thing that will never stop. And that it has to begin now uh, in, in just generating that relationship, generating that understanding, whether you write a grant or not, or whenever you write a grant, uh, it's, it's not, it, it cannot be tied to like whenever you have a deadline. And so, so that, that's something that just has to be part of your, of your research process and your ongoing uh, efforts. So that, that would be my, you know, like what I would suggest to, to to everybody here. But with that, I'm going to pass it on to Catherine to lead the rest of the of the session today with, um, you know, Q and A. Thanks, Moira. Okay, so instructions for the Q and A. I posted this in the chat. If you have any questions, if you could type them out into the chat, and then I'll call on you to ask the question directly. But if you can't do that, just message me and I can ask the, the question on your behalf. Uh, but I haven't seen any questions yet, and that's okay. Start thinking. Uh, I have a question oh, for- sorry. Can we oh. ask people also like if they don't mind, uh, you know, turning the cameras on and, you know, uh, so that we can all see each other in- you know, relate a little bit more closely, even though we're in the virtual world. Yeah, totally. Let's not be robots. Let's show our faces if you can. So I wanted to follow up on the last question uh, and dig a little bit deeper about extractive practices. So Mehana, you use this example of the weather stations where former researchers left weather stations and the community had a desire to clean them up. So I was thinking, okay, is this a broad approach to dealing with extractive uh, practices with indigenous communities or any community? Do we first go in and just ask if we can help with something? Is that one, uh, one strategy on how you might approach this long history of extraction within communities before we actually do the science? I think it's been important to, to be aware of what's gone before. Because sometimes when you enter a community or try to partner with a community, what you'll encounter is the legacy of who came before you and how those relationships were handled and how that work was done. So I think the more you can listen and understand what's been, you know, starting off with what is what does your community want? What are you working for? And, and what what's happened with these issues before? Um, that helps um, and that would surface something like 
hey, you know, we, we, yeah, sure, weather stations, okay, but can we do the ones down close to the community and not in the sacred mountains first? Um, and then, because we want to learn how they work. And then you realize, wow, 20 years ago, these weather stations went in and community didn't really want them because they didn't know what they did. And then they never saw any outcomes from them. They were connected to networks they couldn't connect to. And, you know, so so what emerges is people's past experience. And, and then what we really like is this, you know, so... Um, it isn't it isn't like you can just say, hey, what should we do right up front? If people don't know you, they they will it will emerge and you will bid trust. So that's why what Layla said and what Laura was sharing about the and Layla was sharing about the the grants that can change and the planning grants in that time is so vital because that can be time to to really work together and figure it out. Um, I think there's a need for broader institutional change too. It shouldn't be all on individual researchers and that's happening on the funding side, but also on the university side, there's big needs, but we can talk about that more. I'd love to hear more questions. Awesome, thank you. Okay, we have a lot of comments from Layla in the chat, which are awesome. Okay, uh, Madi, are you, let's see, are you able to unmute yourself and ask your question? Yeah, sure. Thank you okay. so much for everyone and for this great presentation. It was really informative for me. Actually, uh, I have a question regarding solving the problem with participatory modeling. Uh, because uh, this is my own, I mean, I don't have solid background in participatory modeling, but the way that I understand you are going to try uh, to solve the problems and when you are dealing with communities, you are also dealing with some social matters, some social factors that finally you would incorporate it in, the, in your models. So when you are doing models, uh, you might use just like Moira, I know she's working with agent-based models or Laura, is, she's working with system dynamics. So these kinds of model, uh, these kinds of uh, factors is so hard to translate it to just like in model because for example, let's say trust or I don't know, cooperation how how i want to know your experience regarding how are you going to deal with these kind of things because finally you are going to solve those problems and if there is a misunderstanding regarding these kinds of things it our models might not uh, work well and the, 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 the major problem is that for example i as a modeler do not have a solid background in social science so how we are going to deal with these kinds of things? Thanks. Laura, do you want to take a stab? I was just going to say, do you want to take <laughs> <laughs> I'll go after you. <laughs> All right. Um, well, Madi, it's funny you say, you know, these things are hard to put in a model. I once uh, did a model with a community group in Detroit where love was one of the variables. So yeah, uh, and there are actually system dynamics models that depict love. So there you go. Um, Ooh, okay. Um, this is a this is a, a broad question. So I guess the first thing I'm going to do is have you take a bit of a step back, right? Because I think a lot of times when we're trained, particularly in the biophysical modeling realm, we have a certain idea about what a good model is, right? That um, is about being physically accurate, okay? When we're talking about using models in a participatory process, that may not be what we want the model to do. We may, we may want to use it as a deliberation tool, as a communication tool, as a tool to think with, um, as you know, some system dynamicists have said. And in order for it to be effective at that, we have to... Um, show people that their reality and the things that they hold important are included in the model, right? So, you know, one one thing is to, I guess, reframe your notion of like, what is this model, what is the point of this? What is this model supposed to do, right? And how can, how can I best facilitate that? Um, then, uh, you know, certainly it's the case that you're you're not going to be an expert probably at all of the variables and relationships in your model. And that's where you can draw on a broader interdisciplinary team if you're going the route of quantifying it or, you know, doing some more research in that realm. Um, so I'll stop there and see what Moira has to say, because. 
Yeah, no, uh, definitely building along uh, what you're saying. So it depends on what that what you're trying to represent in terms of like trust. Is it is it trust like because that's an essential part of the system that that needs to be understood and therefore modeled, or is it trust? among people around the particular problem that we've got to build that trust and have trust in our own process to come up with solutions, right, to, to that problem. So you don't always have to model trust. It depends, right, as, as Laura was saying, like, is it part of, of the system that, and an essential component of the dynamic of a system that therefore needs to be represented, or it's something that we need to generate as we work together, right? Uh, so there's there's that aspect. And the other is like I was going to put in here, like a, a reference of one of the papers that Laura and I have been part of, which kind of like coalesces like the, the main lessons learned uh, and, and how one person alone cannot do this. Because, of course, it's like, you know, you, we only know what we know. But if we're going to deal with complex issues and complex problems, one person cannot hold all of that. And that's why we so much uh, try to uh, prioritize and and value and support co-creation and the co-creation of that knowledge that can only come from people working together and not just the knowledge of what's going on and what has been going on but what could go on and how our future could be uh so so that's that's the important part like remember if you're going to do this work i wouldn't advise you do it alone right because it's like that's kind of like the the whole premise of why we're doing this right white community engagement because we can't do it alone it's like we wouldn't be relevant we wouldn't be impactful if we did it alone so I'm going to put the, the reference there on the chat. But thank okay. you for the question. All right. Uh, somebody pop a question in. So I, I don't have to keep on answering or asking. Oh, we got something. Oh, that's Mehana. Uh, okay. I have another question for you all. So what if community needs or ideas about the future are in conflict with scientific knowledge and understanding? How do you approach the conflict? And I'm thinking about this from the vantage of living in a Southern state and some of the communities that I engage with uh, will not engage on topics related to climate change. So we have to approach those conversations in different ways. So I wanna hear from all of you, uh, how do you approach conflict? Or how do you run away from it? <laughs> <laughs> Learn how to do it because it's inevitable. That's the yeah, first thing I'm that's say. Exactly. <laughs> Expect it. I think you try to understand the source of it to know it's going to be there, anticipate it, build in ways to deal with conflict, um, but also try to understand what kind of conflict it is. Like a lot of times, um, in Hawaiian communities. Well, well first of all, um, I wanted to acknowledge the Wampanoag and the um, Mi'kmaq people um, and the, the beautiful acknowledgement in the flyer about this presentation. Um, and I went to school at Harvard. I never connected to the native people of the Boston area. Um, and that wasn't part of something our university, we had a Native American center, but it wasn't tied to the community there. So sometimes conflict is based in lots of stuff that happened before you, right? There's always gonna be an indigenous community. We always have different layers of disrespect, distrust with institutions. Um, so I think, again, trying to be there with people in the South, what are people going through? What is their distrust of climate science? Where does that come from? And then if you can, peeling back layers, like sometimes, um, and, and ways to connect. Like I, I talked about being on land, maybe being on land, people can talk about changes they're seeing in the animals they hunt, in the things they harvest, in the places they live, in the ways trees flower. And that is climate change, but maybe we don't have to say that it is. Um, sometimes it's the language and the labeling and the politics attached to language, but really there's a lot of agreement under there that gets us past conflict. Um, I try to understand what's disagreement and what's non-agreement. There's always agreement and disagreement, and disagreement's hard to work with, but non-agreement is actually a very rich, fertile space <laughs> to create knowledge together. Um, also, a lot of times research that wants to engage community knowledge is really just about, um, I think they have emic and edict, but it's the idea that community knowledge will prove the science. 
right? And it will verify the science. And if you're going in with that, like, is, is that what you want? Are you trying to create new science? Um, are you trying to create these two different kinds of, take weave these two different kinds of science? Also, are you trying to just, um, what's the word, mash them into each other? Like a lot of the things now are about braiding or weaving where the strands maintain their distinctness, but they make something more beautiful and full. Um, I guess in, I, I know a lot of communities, they struggle because they're doing, say, marine transects for environmental monitoring, but they know that the fish are not on that transect. So they want to do more like time swims that are holistic. So a lot of times as researchers, we're, our training is very narrow and we're trained to look at one resource, one variable in the model, one um, and, and try to contain the rest of it, where a lot of times communities want to look holistic. They want to look at everything mountain to sea. How do you put that in your model? They want to look, um, you know, cross generationally. So thinking about ways that models can be made less simple, um, and 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 contain a more a, a broader diversity and holism of knowledge, I think is important in re reducing con conflict in this successful kind of. Work. Thank you so much. I see Thomas had a, a had a question, but like also Laura had something to add to this in terms of like the the um essentially the white Western culture of doing science, especially academic science that I think is tied to also how do we deal with conflict, right? And like, yeah. you know, yeah, if you want to go ahead. Uh, yeah, I was just gonna say that um if you are coming from a white Western cultural background, you're at a disadvantage here because probably the way you were taught to deal with conflict is to avoid it, be nice, smile, and pretend it doesn't exist. And I'm gonna tell you, that does not work. <laughs> so if you are engaging in any kind of, really any kind of deep collaboration with anybody who's different than you, I highly recommend that you get better at handling conflict. And whether that's through therapy, through reading books, through practicing with your, friends and partners maybe, um, but it, it's, it's, it's vital. It is absolutely vital. I can't overstate that. And the thing is that you learn about it and, and uh, Amanda Ripley says it in this book, conflict is not bad. Conflict can be highly productive and constructive and generative if it's handled well. If it's handled poorly, it can, can become toxic. But you know, essentially this is a tool to better understand each other and better understand the problem if you engage with it with it well. Um, so rather than running away, we're like, oh my gosh, we disagree. You know, we had a tense conversation, you know, like try to dig in to be compassionate, to be curious, you know, all the things Mahana said, like try to find common ground. Um, it, it, it's incredibly rewarding. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Uh, let's move on to, to Thomas. Can you unmute yourself and ask your question? Yeah. Thanks for, um, the great discussion so far. And my question goes back to the thread of using models in this um, community engaged or participatory research. And I just wanted to know if any of you all had some like really specific examples from your previous work or work you've heard about where people have deployed models and either use them very effectively in community engaged work or maybe use them not so effectively um, just to get an idea for what that looks like um, in your experience. Laura, go for it. <laughs> Good, I was going to say, Moira, go ahead. Um, well, I mean, so I've seen, a, so I hesitate to label things good and bad, right? Um, but I, I've seen a lot of modeling work, um, certainly that doesn't have the impact it could because it is removed from the reality of the people who would use it, which is exactly the reason for, you know, doing this in a more engaged way. Um, you know, I, I've been a part of projects where I, I do think it has gone quite well in the sense that people have emerged from it, um, you know, with new insights. So I think, you know, the, um, the engagement that we just wrapped up in Flint is a good example. That was a five-year project. And honestly, that engagement was less about the model outputs and more about the deep engagement with um, folks really trying to make sense of the food system in Flint and how they could transform it um, And in the, in the light of the Flint water crisis. Um, 
And so coming up with some, you know, really key insights about what was keeping the system stuck and what could get it out of that stuck space, um, I think was was really valuable. Um, again, I think the 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 modeling projects I've seen that were maybe less successful are simply where, you know, the modeler was working on something that ultimately was not of use to the community, the decision maker. And so it just sat on a shelf and was ignored, right? Um, yeah, but Moira, I'm sure you have examples. Oh, yes, <laughs> many. Uh, but I think I think that building on what Laura was just sharing, I, I think, I mean, there's so many things that I want to say, but at least that I can, you know, maybe I share what I what I recommend and what I teach in my in my participatory modeling class. So I I teach two what I think are two essential skills. One is meditation. The other is improv or art and or art. And uh, the reason for that is that we need to have that space of just being grounded and open and humble and compassionate, and know that again we are not experts or we are as equally experts as the people we're interacting with. And just, you know, just being mindful of that, being mindful of our own biases, which, you know, like conflict, they're inevitable, but let's at least be aware of them. And the improv and art part, because we have to be creative and, and creative with others. So I always find useful to, to um, use a metaphor of collage making or collaborative collage making as, uh, you know, what, what, Color, you know, participatory modeling could uh, could be, and so I think that it it is really important to. And what I've also found important over time is to move away from this idea of like, and 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 again, it's the tension with the way that proposals are written and are demanded also by the sponsors, right? Like you have to have a plan. Well, I can have a plan, but that plan has to stay open because it co-evolves. The work co-evolves. And I'm moving away from things like formalized workshops. Yes, sometimes we have formalized structured workshops, but it doesn't work to do that. Like to start with, you've got to start with meetings, conversations, trying a few things here, adding some things there. It takes time. It's not something and I can say, okay, every two months, I'm going to have this workshop and we're going to go from here to here and to here and to here. It just doesn't work that way. It doesn't work well that way. Trust me, I tried it. It wasn't good, <laughs> okay? So don't make the same mistakes, right? I did this 15 years ago. Let's not do this again, okay? So so let's move away from that and actually think of engaging in an ongoing conversation that takes a while, that is more organic, more unstructured. And we use and we build these tools that help us, that are like boundary objects to help us with that conversation that we build together as we go along. And kind of like in line with what Laura was saying as well, it's the modeling that is important, not the model. So it's like the process of collaborative learning through model building and model using uh, and from the participatory modeling side. Then there are a whole other participatory processes that use other kinds of boundary objects or, or, or activities, right? But that's that's what I would you know probably share as you know insights to think about um, uh, in terms of what works better than other things. And then it doesn't always work. The, the, the fact is that it doesn't always work and you've got to remain open to that possibility and you know with your heart open especially and your mind open as a beginner beginner mind right and like really embrace that uncertainty and and work with it the best the best we can with compassion Moira, can i add one thing cuz i know we're close to time and and wrapping up but thomas you know you asked for some concrete examples i'll just say three things to me were the key if it worked or not connected to the ground connected to realities on the ground hands on and a long-term look. So I've been a part of projects that were modeling climate change and then downscaling to the local context. They didn't work when they didn't scale down enough. And people were like, this isn't telling me anything for my place, you know? And also when people couldn't engage with the models and input information. Um, when we did work really well, it went really long-term because people said, this has always been happening. It isn't just new. So we went into the Hawaiian language newspapers from the 1800s to get data from then as well about the frequency of storms and floods. And people really liked that. It also worked when people could put in their own observations on like their phones when we had 
you know, simple, we gather data from Facebook. We made a Facebook page, like when is the river high? And you're, you know, and cause we were trying to correlate rainfall with river flooding and create models of that um, as well as with storms and storm direction and, and that sort of thing. Um, and the, the, the on the ground scientists, like our hydrologists were really helpful to our atmospheric scientists who were a little more, a little less ground connected for the community, but having both, having field visits, um, that all really, really helped and finding ways that community are used that they could contribute data and that that could be, you know, a part of the data. Um, and then just one other example, we have a network of fish pond restoration in Hawaii, and there's a great scientist, Brian Glazer, who makes monitors for the fish ponds. and the communities make them themselves and they're really simple and they just float in the makaha, the entry gates. So they're looking at a modeling sea level rise and the impact on these aquatic systems. Um, and the community can see that working every day. They can see the data, they can tweak the instrument themselves. Um, and it's really simple, it's really cost effective. And so now communities all across Hawaii are, work, are using it. And in terms of scalability, right? And scalability of knowledge, people wanna be place-based, but yet we, we have to make broader academic knowledge, right? And so that's another thing that works is when you have networks and partnerships. So a lot of places can combine their data together and it becomes a larger, broader data set, but, that's, but it's still based in place and partnership. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And uh, Kelly, thank you for your question. I see that Layla answered some of it, but thank you for your question uh, as well. So Catherine, do you want to wrap us up? Sure. Thank you all for attending. This is our first virtual coffee hour, and it was so fabulous. Thank you to Mehana and Laura and Layla for the, the time that you put to, into this today, but also in preparation. And I encourage anybody, uh, if they have any follow-up questions, to reach out directly to our, our speakers today. And thank you all for participating. We'll have another coffee hour, hopefully in the spring.